This is Nine News with Michael Thompson. Good evening and welcome to a special one-hour edition of Nine's Late News as Russia attacks Ukraine. This is a live shot of the Ukraine capital, Kiev, right now, a city at war. This is a developing situation and we have reporters on the ground and experts on standby to break down this conflict. Europe correspondent Karian Greenbank begins our coverage. Ukraine waking to war. In the capital, Kiev, blasts break the night sky. And sirens sound as Russia begins its invasion, launching airstrikes at targets across the country. A missile hitting an airport in western Ukraine. An Australian journalist filming the moment one strike was launched in the country's east. Oh! That's a missile. That's a missile. That was one of those like holy. While at an aerodrome in the south, a man points to the destruction, saying there's a crater behind me still smoking. Reports of injuries and deaths slowly filtering through. Locals filming as they witness troops on the streets of Kharkiv, the country's second biggest city. In the capital, the streets were choked with cars as families escape, heeding the warning calls. You might be able to hear that siren now, actually. So as well as the explosions, we've got a siren that has just started. It's been a really surreal morning, actually. While residents try to get out, tanks roll in from the Belarus border. Sparked by words the world had been nervously awaiting, Vladimir Putin, in a televised address, announcing his decision to conduct a special military operation in Ukraine's Donbass region. The aim, he said, to protect its people from genocide and to stop the Nazification of Ukraine, with this chilling warning for Ukrainian soldiers. We urge you to lay down arms immediately and go home. Russia's response will be immediate and lead you to such consequences that you have never faced in your history. The Russian president pulling the trigger as the United Nations Security Council held an emergency meeting, imploring him not to. I have only one thing to say from the bottom of my heart. President Putin, stop your troops from attacking the Ukraine. Give peace a chance. Too many people have already died. Ambassadors from the US and UK also making urgent pleas. This is a perilous moment, and we're here for one reason and one reason only, to ask Russia to stop, return to your borders, send your troops and your tanks and your planes back to their barracks and hangars. We are here tonight to call on Russia to avert war. Earlier this evening, Ukraine's president revealed he had called Mr Putin. The result was silence, he said. Speaking in Russian and directly addressing the people of Russia, Volodymyr Zelensky made an 11th hour plea of his own. If the Russian leaders don't want to sit with us behind the table for the sake of peace, maybe they will sit behind the table with you. And when you will be attacking us, you will see our faces, not our backs. But the appeal fell on deaf ears. The Ukrainian leader addressing the nation, asking the Ukrainian people to stand firm and declaring Russia has embarked on a path of evil. Police are now clearing the streets, those who have nowhere to go, taking shelter in underground metro stations. And the latest reports from the Ukrainian government is that more than 40 soldiers have been killed and several dozen injured. Russia tonight denies its aircraft have been downed over Ukraine. Straight to Kari and Greenbank, live in Kiev. Kari, there's been another round of airstrikes across the country. Well, Michael, there has been reports of a second round of missile strikes and just in the past hour we have heard two loud explosions off in the distance. Uh, we've also seen Ukrainian military vehicles rolling through the streets behind us in Kiev. But the big concern for a lot of people now is to get out of the country, uh, potentially, particularly get out of the capital. So there's traffic gridlock all around Kiev at the moment. There's gridlock right to the border. Uh, there's also queues of people lining up at ATMs and petrol stations trying to get out enough cash, trying to get 
get out enough fuel. But President Zelensky has held a televised address where he is calling up anyone with military experience to stand up and fight. He's saying that the Ukrainian government will supply them with weapons. He's saying anyone that doesn't have military experience can donate blood to help the wounded soldiers, saying that he is set to introduce uh, martial law in the country soon. Now, early this morning, he was speaking with President uh, Biden, also speaking with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson is just about to announce his own national address where he will be unveiling what he says is a raft of very strong sanctions. Uh, we are set to see more strong sanctions from the EU, from the US as well. And as we go to air right now, NATO is also holding a press conference. Uh, they say that they will be uh, bringing more troops into Eastern Europe. And in the words of the NATO chief, he says, peace on our continent has been shattered. Michael? Kari, thank you. And as Kari just mentioned, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, has just spoken. Let's take a look at that now. Good afternoon. Russia has attacked Ukraine. This is a brutal act of war. Our thoughts are with the brave people of Ukraine. Sadly, what we have warned against for months has come to pass. Despite all calls on Russia to change course and tireless efforts to seek a diplomatic solution. Peace on our continent has been shattered. We now have war in Europe on a scale and of a, and of a type we thought belonged to history. We have just finished a meeting of the North Atlantic Council to discuss the situation. The Council also addressed the request by Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania and Slovakia to hold urgent consultations under Article 4 of the Washington Treaty. This is a grave moment for the security of uh, Europe. Russia's unjustified and unprovoked attack on, Ukraine's, on Ukraine is putting countless innocent lives at risk. With air and missile attacks, ground forces and special forces from multiple directions, targeting military infrastructure and major urban centers. This is a deliberate, cold-blooded and long-planned invasion. Despite its litany of lies, denials and disinformation, the Kremlin's intentions are clear for the world to see. Russia's leaders bear full responsibility for their reckless actions and the lives lost. NATO allies condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine in the strongest possible terms. It is a blatant violation of international law an act of aggression against a sovereign, independent and peaceful country, and a serious threat to Euro-Atlantic security. We call on Russia to immediately cease its military action, withdraw its forces from Ukraine and choose diplomacy. We fully support Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and Ukraine's right to self-defense. Russia is using force to try to rewrite history and deny Ukraine its free and independent path. NATO's core task is to protect and defend all allies. There must be no room for miscalculation or misunderstanding. An attack on one will be regarded as an attack on all. This is our collective security guarantee. Today, the North Atlantic Council decided to activate our defense plans at the request of our top military commander, General Todd Walters. This is a prudent and defensive step to protect and shield allied nations during this crisis. And it will enable us to deploy capabilities and forces, including the NATO response force, to where they are needed. 
In response to Russia's massive military build-up, we have already strengthened our collective defense on land, at sea, and in the air. In the last weeks, allies from North America and Europe have deployed thousands or more troops to the eastern part of the lines and placed more on standby. We have over 100 jets at high alert protecting our airspace and more than 120 Allied ships at sea from the high north to the Mediterranean. All this shows that our collected defence commitment, Article 5, is ironclad. We will continue to do whatever is necessary to shield the Alliance from aggression. I have called a virtual summit of NATO leaders tomorrow to address the way forward. Russia is now facing severe costs and consequences imposed by the whole international community. The Kremlin's aim is to re-establish its sphere of influence, rip up the global rules that have kept us all safe for decades, and subvert the values that we hold dear. This is the new normal for our security. Peace cannot be taken for granted. Freedom and democracy are contested by authoritarian regimes. And strategic competition is on the rise. We must respond with renewed resolve and even stronger unity. North America and Europe together in NATO. That's Jens Stoltenberg, Secretary General of NATO, speaking there. Let's now hear from Professor of International Security and Intelligence Studies, John Blacksland, who joins me now. John, thanks so much for your time tonight. Let's break this down firstly. Why is Putin invading Ukraine and why today? So it goes back 30 years to the dissolution of the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War and the decision to break up the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics uh, the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet-aligned Eastern European countries, and then a gleeful embrace of NATO by those countries who'd had nearly half a century of living under Soviet domination. And uh, he, Vladimir Putin has long resented that. He has been building up Russia for the last two decades, trying to re-establish Russian do uh, military power, to reassert Russian military greatness. This is Vladimir the Great echoing Peter the Great, the expansionist uh, uh, Russian czar who expanded the Russian Empire. This is a man who sees NATO as a threat, even though NATO is a shadow of its former self. It's nothing like it. He resents its appeal to the East, to all of the Eastern Europeans, East Germany, where he used to work as a KGB officer. But why now? This is really, you know, the, who can read the mind of Vladimir Putin? It is, it is, a, it is going to be keeping us busy for a long time. Uh, the world's holding its breath. Uh, the Ukrainian leaders, how do you think they've responded so far? Well, they've res responded with resolve and courage. They've called a state of emergency. They've called up their forces. They are looking at, they've established martial law. They're trying to generate resistance and strength. Uh, they have spent the last few years building up their own armed forces. Of course, they're not on the scale of Russia and they're not as modern as Russia. And of course, they've wanted to join NATO, but that's not on the cards at the moment. Although it will be interesting to see just how this crystallises the minds of the leaders of NATO, because there's many, particularly in Eastern Europe, Poland, Czech Republic and elsewhere, who are deeply worried about the implications. If, we let, if they let Ukraine go unchecked, what are the implications for them? Will they be next? Will Vladimir Putin be sated? Will his appetite for expansion and for subservience from neighbouring states be satisfied? Probably not. And this is the grave concern. The implications are long and deep. John, from what you were saying earlier, it sounded like the die was already cast. So is that why the weeks of diplomacy failed? So, yeah, this is really interesting. Why is it that 
I mean, he, he ostensibly was arguing he wanted Ukraine to commit to never joining NATO and the NATO alliance never uh, agreed to never uh, accepting or inviting formally Ukraine to join. And he de facto was getting that. No one was seriously contemplating including Ukraine in NATO. Uh, and yet that wasn't enough. That seemed to have been a smokescreen for him to position himself. And, you know, we don't really know if this was just a decision he came up with at the last minute. Um, we do know that that he has been building up his force to give himself the options to do this. So this is a country that GDP-wise is close to Australia. He's been investing an enormous amount of the nation's wealth on military power rather than on hospitals and schools and, and infrastructure. So this is what the people of Russia get when you allow a, an authoritarian thug to run your country unelected effectively and the world is now reaping the whirlwind of his actions and his mindset and his approach. John what are the implications for Australia and Asia? So you know many can say oh John Ukraine's a long way away well in this day and age particularly in the cyber domain we're more connected than ever and there are real alerts being rung now about the prospects of cyber attack in our neck of the woods but more broadly, there's a really important point about the international order. The order that we all signed up to in 1945 at the end of the Second World War, when the San Francisco Treaty was signed and the United Nations was established, the idea was that we wouldn't take countries by force without some kind of legitimacy granted by the UN resolutions and UN endorsement. Now, of course, the devil's in the detail of the, the, the aberrations thereof. But essentially, this in Europe is the first time this has happened since 1945. And it sets a really important precedent that President Xi in China will be closely studying because this has implications for, for Taiwan. He, Putin has been saying Ukraine has no legitimacy. It is not a nation. He can absorb it uh, as at will. If that is left unchecked, if we do not push back on this, there are implications for President Xi in China with his attitude towards the South China Sea and, of course, to Taiwan. And that is gravely uh, of concern in our neck of the woods. So the implications on the middle of the Eurasian landmass and the far eastern end of the landmass are intimately connected. It's a frightening scenario. What about the Ukrainian people? How do you see their future, short term and long term? So we've seen the uh, line of cars trying to get out of Kiev, going to uh, seek refuge elsewhere. I imagine the neighbouring countries will be looking to shelter many of them in the coming days and weeks. Um, it will be interesting to see how much resolve there is in Ukraine to resist Russian uh, domination. Of course, there are examples of uh, deep-seated resentment and pushback on Russian military power in the past. Russia has had successes in, in Donetsk and Luhansk in the Donbass in the eastern Ukraine, but not in the Ukrainian heart. And if you think of a couple of examples of Grozny, where they were not welcome, and in Afghanistan, where they were not welcome, uh, the, there are prospects of a lot of bloodshed, sadly. Uh, and, and it's just tragic that this man with so much power had, was concentrated in the in the hands of this one man is turning out to be such a clever but evil man. John, from what you've been saying all the way through, the reaction of the rest of the world is just crucial going forward. Absolutely. And here's the key point. You know, no one wants to go in and militarily confront Russia in Ukraine because we don't want a nuclear confrontation. We've been, we've been the beneficiaries of that idea of mutually assured destruction by the countervailing nuclear weapons forces of the great powers since, the, you know, more, it's been over 70 years. No one wants that. But what we need to do is send a very clear message that this is not acceptable. And the only way to do that, I believe, effectively, is if all of the countries around the world, the G7, the G20, NATO, the ASEAN countries and Latin Americans and elsewhere agree to impose the kind of Magnitsky Act constraints on the oligarchs, on those close to Vladimir Putin, that send a powerful message that you personally are going to cop it financially, personally, even if we're not going to take you on in terms of your nuclear prowess, we will make you pay. 
They are frightening times. John Blacksland, so much, thank you so much for your thoughts and uh, analytics tonight on the situation. Thanks for having the program, Michael. There have been more explosions heard near Kiev. Let's go now to CNN reporter uh, Attica Schubert. Attica, what's the latest from where you are? Well, things have calmed down considerably from this morning, at least here in Lviv in western Ukraine. We're about an hour away from Poland. Earlier this morning, we had a series of air raid sirens, and it does seem that several sites were hit in western Ukraine, including a military, excuse me, an, an airport about 100 kilometers from here that is sometimes used by the military. It looks as though Russian troops are trying to uh, damage uh, Ukrainian, Ukraine's air defenses first before moving further in. Um, but here is the safest part of the country, frankly. It's much worse in Kyiv, in the capital, where those missile strikes are continuing into the afternoon. Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine and Odessa, the southern port city. And we're now getting reports that Russian ground troops have moved in from Belarus in the north and from Crimea in the south. So this does appear to be a full-scale invasion, Michael. And so take it. Thank you so much for your time. Australian citizens who are in Ukraine are tonight being told to seek shelter, while back home Prime Minister Scott Morrison has announced a second wave of tough sanctions on key Russian banks and officials. Politics reporter Rachel Baxter has the details. Scott Morrison has announced a